Wow. Good morning. It's good to see y'all. Derek was on Lion. Second service is a little different than first. This is nice. Um, if I've met you before, my name's Brian. Uh, my wife and I run Second Home Support Network, which is a, uh, a, a support network for foster, adoptive, and kinship families in the area. And we're one of the mission partners here at Lake Springs. And uh, we're I'm excited to come and share with you guys today. But in addition to that, about six or so years ago, uh, my wife and I helped uh, plant a church up in the North Raleigh area where I served as one of the pastors and she ran the kids ministry there. And we just uh, kind of transitioned away from there as we moved to Holly Springs at the beginning of this year. And we've been plugging in here. So I'm grateful to be here and excited to share with you guys today. Uh, as we begin this morning, I want to ask you a question or I want you to think about something. And that's this. It's, it's what makes you, you? What makes you who you are? Or what are your kind of defining features? Or what do you think of when you think of yourself? Uh, for myself, what I have learned is one of my most defining features is that I am bald. <laughs> now, whether, well, yeah, hello. <laughs> um, now, whether I want this to be a defining feature or not, I, I don't know, it's up, up in the air. But I've just learned that whether I want it to be or not, it is. Because it is something that gets pointed out more often than anything else in my life. Mostly by complete strangers in the grocery store, people I walk past. And it's, it's all great. It's all nice. It's, you know, obviously it's all, it's all good. When it, when it gets a little not nice is when I have, like, friends that have, like, they download, like, the, the bald app. Like, it see what you look like bald and text it to me. And they're like, I'm like you now. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Hilarious. Um, but uh, I've just learned that that's, that's, I mean, that's just who I am. But people really uh, notice it, it turns out. And this, this, I really noticed this a couple years ago. Um, a buddy of mine started planted a church out in the Greensboro area of um, North Carolina, and we were there for their launch Sunday. And I'd gotten there a little late, and so I was standing in the back. There were no seats available. And just kind of like in this little crowd of people in the back. And it was the middle of worship. People's eyes are closed, uh, hands up, just lights down. And middle of a song, and all of a sudden I, I get this, I get, feel this hand on my shoulder, and I feel this whisper that is just, far too intimately close to my ear, where someone just says, hey, nice haircut. <laughs> like, it scared me. I was like, oh, and, and I turned, and it's someone I've never met, never seen him again in my life, but he gave me the old bald guy salute. He turned back, and he's like, hey, I'm like, all right, and, and never seen him again. But I just learned that that's, that's who I am, and that's cool. But, but throughout my life, I've, there's been all sorts of other things that I've kind of uh, found my identity in. When I, was, when I was younger, I was really into certain kinds of music, and I'd pour all of my time and money into music, not playing, tried that, it was terrible, but in, in band clothes and going to shows and stuff like that. And then time went on a little bit, and, and my whole life revolved around whether or not I was in a relationship, and whether or not I was in a relationship with this one specific girl. And I married her, so that one worked out fine. But... For a while, it was like everything hinged on that. Or I'm from the Detroit area, and we like cars with big engines. And so it was all about what kind of car I had, and, and if it was better than the last car I had, and if it was better than my buddy's car. And everything hinged on these things. And then further into adulthood, it was whether or not we were married yet, whether or not we had kids yet. And all these things I found my identity in. And so the question I want us to ask this morning is this. It's where do you find your identity? Where do you find your identity? See, today we're looking at a story of a man who essentially had his identity assigned to him by society, but regardless, he still found his identity in Jesus. Uh, so we're going to be in Mark chapter 10 today, starting in verse 46. If you've got a Bible, you're welcome to open up with me there. And as, as you're opening up there, I want to give us a little, I don't know, disclaimer or challenge as we're going into this. We're going to be reading a story about Jesus healing a blind man. And if you've been in church for a long time, or if you're very familiar with the Bible, sometimes we can hear these stories that are a little more common, or that, that we've heard kind of a bunch of times, and they can go a little bit in, your one, in one ear and out the other. Spoiler alert, there's a blind man, Jesus heals him. And I feel like sometimes we can think about these stories, and that's what we take away. And that's a good thing. But there's more there. And so I want to challenge you, if, if this is a story that you are familiar with, to try and look at it with fresh eyes as we dig into it this morning. So um, the, kind of what's going on here is we're getting to the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. 
and he's, he's with his followers, and they're coming up to Jerusalem. They're traveling to Jerusalem for Passover, and what's going to become the last Passover meal, or what's known as the Last Supper. And as they're traveling along the road, they come across this man. And this is where we pick it up in Mark chapter 10, verse 46. So then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. So seeing someone begging outside city gates was a regular thing in this day because there was no social program set up for someone who was blind or someone who was disabled, and you had to rely on the generosity of others. You had to rely on people um, kind of dropping things for you as they're traveling or as they're going about their way. But the unusual thing here is that Mark um, records his name. And if, if we read throughout the book of Mark, he doesn't record many names of people that are healed, but he records his name, which probably means that he ended up going on to do something that made him known to Mark's original readers. And what we see here is that his name is Bartimaeus, and what we're told is that it means son of Timaeus. But what we're not told is that the name Timaeus, his father's name, what it means is it means someone that is valued highly. And so this man who is looked down on by society, who didn't have much social status, or didn't see much worth, or society didn't put much worth in him, the most he could say for himself was that he was the son of someone who had value. And we continue in verse 47. It says, When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So it's clear that he knew who Jesus was, that he heard of him before, as he cries out, Son of David, have mercy on me. But what's interesting here is Jesus does nothing to silence him. If, we, if you read throughout the book of Mark, over and over again, people kind of call Jesus by his title or some defining name of his, and he silences them. Because it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily the, the time that he wants his identity to be made public or to be known. But what we see here is he's about to come into Jerusalem. This is kind of the culmination of his entire earthly ministry is going to happen here. He's going to end up being crucified and resurrected. And so he's okay with kind of it being known who he is. He does nothing to silence him. And notice what Bartimaeus asks for as he cries out to him. He asks for mercy. He just says, son of David, have mercy on me. And in doing this, he's acknowledging that he doesn't deserve to be healed, that Jesus is superior to him, that he, is, um, that he doesn't deserve anything, but he's just crying out, have mercy on me. So we continue in 48, we kind of see some people's response. Verse 48 says, many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. See, this verse showed, uh, shows us how society viewed people like him. What's interesting is that some of these people in the crowd, in Jesus' crowd, would have been with him as they saw him perform other miracles and seen him heal other people. But even though they would have known Jesus had the power to heal him, they still told him, hey, shh, quiet down. Don't interrupt. Know your place. See, blind people in this time were not just looked down on because they couldn't work or couldn't do things that other people could do, but it was seen as almost like a curse from God either for the person's sin or for the sins of the parents. In fact, if we look at John 9, Jesus and his disciples see a blind man. It says this at the beginning of John 9. It says, as he, as Jesus, went along, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. See, this is how society viewed people like him. It wasn't something that garnered sympathy or, or, or anything like that. You were viewed as someone who was cursed, couldn't contribute to society, you couldn't care for yourself, and who probably deserved their lot in life. This is how people saw them. And the funny thing is, is if you were blind, the last thing you want to do is upset anybody. Because your, your livelihood depends on the generosity of others. So the last thing you want to do is rile people up or upset people. If someone tells you to be quiet, you're going to be quiet. However, people telling him to be quiet didn't stop him. It didn't, it didn't stop him. And despite people telling him to be quiet, Jesus has a different response, which we see starting in verse 49. Verse 49 says, Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. And throwing, up, throwing, uh, throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. Now, I love the change in people's kind of demeanor here, the change in their response, where one minute they're saying, hey, telling him, quiet down, don't interrupt. And then as soon as Jesus says, call him, they're like, hey, cheer up. What's the, what's the problem? Just come, come on. Jesus wants you now. But despite Jesus' mission of getting to Jerusalem, despite Bartimaeus' low social status, Jesus still stops for him. He takes the initiative to call this man to him, even when the people wanted him to be quiet. 
See, Jesus cared about the issues that most people saw as insignificant or not worth the time. And it makes me think of this. We, um, my wife and I, we're, we're foster parents, so the, the number of ch- children in our home fluctuates from time to time. But currently, we have three kids. We have a four-year-old boy, a three-year-old girl, and a one-year-old girl. Our four-year-old boy, his name is Theo, Theodore. Um, he is, he's, he's the greatest. He's, he's the funniest, most hilarious person in the world. But he gets super hyper-focused on different things. He, he finds an interest, and he, like, he locks onto it. For a while, when he was a little bit younger, he was really into school buses. Where, like, school bus time in the morning, we'd watch out the window, that was the greatest, the school bus coming by. And then time went on, he got really into excavators. Like, no other construction equipment mattered, but if he saw a real-life excavator, it was like, it was like seeing the, the promised land. It was, he couldn't believe that it was a real excavator. And now, what, the, what he's fixated on and what he's really into, and it's been with him for a little bit of time now, is he's really into squids. The animal, squids. It's, it, I, I don't know why. He calls them squibs, and so we call them squibs. So, and if I say that, I apologize. But he gets super, he's really into squids for some reason. All other animals are cool. Sharks are cool. Other sea creatures are cool. But squids is where it's at for him. So we, we've gotten every squid book out of the library. We get them over and over. He asks the librarian for squibs, and she's like, why do you want a squid book? And, but we get them, and then we read them, and we return them and get them again, and we watch shows on squids, and, and it, it's, it's a blast, and he loves it. has a bunch of squid toys. But what I've come to find out is the more that we spend time with squids, the more I realize I'm kind of into squids. <laughs> They're the weirdest, coolest creatures in the world. Like, did you know that in between all their tentacles, they have a mouth that's called a beak, and it looks like a parrot's beak? And inside, they have like a tongue with razors that rotate around. It's, it's the, they're most, the most bizarre things in the world. But the fact of the matter is, is it, no offense to anybody, but who cares about squids? Like, it, it's not a big deal. Most likely, he's not going to grow up to be a marine biologist. Maybe he will, and that's cool, but he's four, so who knows? In the grand scheme of his life, squids are pretty insignificant. And so it would be easy to just look at something insignificant that, insignificant that he cares about and know that that's not really going to affect his life at all and who cares about it. But if you're a parent, you've, you've experienced this before. That's not how you treat your kids' interests. What, what your kids are interested in is, is interested in ends up being kind of what you're interested in. And just like a parent who cares for the insignificant things that don't really matter that their kids care about, God cares about the things that his children care about. So what I want us to see here. It's simply this, it's that your problems matter to God. Your problems matter to God. I think it can be real easy to have things in our lives that maybe they're not life or death. Maybe they seem small in the grand scheme of things, and so we feel guilty bringing them to God, or we don't do that because other people have bigger problems than we do. But I think what we can see is that our problems matter to God. See, in the grand scheme of things, Bartimaeus' blindness was pretty unimportant to the world. You know, if this story didn't exist, if Jesus would have just kept on going, the book of Mark would have been about seven, chap- or, uh, seven verses shorter. The Bible still would exist. Jesus still would have gone on, died on the cross, resurrected. Salvation would have been brought to mankind. Our lives today, I don't know, probably wouldn't have been changed very much. But his life was changed. Jesus wasn't looking at how I can, he, he had already performed a lot of mir, uh, healing miracles. It wasn't, how can I prove my power to everybody else? And here's an opportunity to, to do it. It was, here's the needs of one man, and that's worth stopping for. See, Jesus was about to come into Jerusalem. He had a busy calendar. He had a lot going on. It would have been easy to not stop. But he put everything on pause to stop for this man. And what does it say that, he do, that Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus does? It says he threw his cloak aside. Now, it says threw his cloak aside. This isn't like he was so excited that he just like supermaned off his jacket and ran to Jesus. His cloak would have been what he would put on the ground in front of him as he was sitting outside the city gates. And it would have been a place where people could drop anything they wanted to give to him, money or food or anything like that. And so what he's doing is he's symbolically throwing aside his old life. He's throwing aside potentially what little he has to run to Jesus. We're not told this, but it's very possible that he had things in his cloak, things that had been dropped for him that were still in there as he threw it aside and ran to Jesus because Jesus was the most important thing in front of him. So we continue reading in verse 51. 
It says he, he, that he, he jumped to his feet, he ran to Jesus, and then we see Jesus' response. He says, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. Now, I think this begs the question, why does Jesus ask him what he wants him to do? It's pretty obvious what he needs. He can tell that he's blind. But even though his need was clear, Jesus was giving him an opportunity to express his own need. He was giving this person that society put little value in, an opportunity, or he was giving him agency and an opportunity to express his own needs. And what's really interesting is if we contrast this with a conversation that we see a little earlier in this chapter in Mark, we see Jesus ask the exact same thing to two different people, and it's, it, it's a very, the story goes very differently. So if we jump back a little bit to um, Mark chapter, or, uh, chapter 10, verse 35, so just a few verses back in this chapter, we see Jesus talking to a couple of his disciples, James and John. And he says this, starting in verse 30, 35, it says, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want, you to, or we, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked, the exact same response. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. See, these are two very different responses to Jesus' same question, where Jesus is asking, what do you want me to do for you? And one, the, the two disciples, they say, we want our own glory. And Bartimaeus just says, have mercy on me. See, I think we can look at these two examples, and I think it, it's, it, it should cause us to ask a question in our own lives, and that's this. It's, do I want Jesus, or do I just want something from Jesus? Do I want a relationship with Jesus, even if none of my prayers are answered the way that I want them to be? Even if everything that I hope happens, everything I've been begging God to happen, happens the exact opposite of what I think should happen, do I still want a relationship with Jesus, or is he just a means to an end? What does my relationship look like with Jesus when things are going terribly versus when they're going great? Am I just praising God when things are great, but then when they're terrible, I'm turning my back on him? Or do I always want a relationship with Jesus? Do I want him or do I just want something from him? See, Bartimaeus doesn't ask for his own glory. But we can see what he says in verse 51. Continuing in verse 51, Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? Then, he, then it continues and it says, the blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see go, Jesus said, your faith has healed you. See, not only was Jesus willing to heal, uh, hear his needs, but he fulfilled his needs. Jesus didn't look at this blind beggar the way that society did or that anyone else would have, but he saw needs and he fulfilled them. And Jesus sees you in the same way that he saw him. So if you're struggling in your life or have something that you're, that you're asking God for help with, I think it's important to ask ourselves, do we actually have faith that God can do what we're asking him to do? If I'm praying for something or if I'm asking God to move in some way, do I actually believe that he can do what I'm asking him to do? Now, as I say that, I want to give a caveat here. This does not mean that if your prayers are not answered the way that you think or that things are going wrong in your life, that it's simply due to a lack of faith. And that if you just have more faith, life will get better for you. That is the furthest thing from what I'm saying. But I think we need to ask, are we just going through the motions or do we actually believe that God can do the things that we're asking him to do? See, Jesus wants you to come to him with your needs. He, he wants you to come to him with your struggles, and he offers healing, not because he has to, but because your problems matter to him. He loves you, and a loving father cares about his children. And if we jump back into this chapter, or as we see the end of this verse, and the end of this section, we can see what happens next. Jesus told him, your faith has healed you, and it says, immediately he received his sight, and he followed Jesus along the road. See, once his sight was restored, he followed Jesus. Jesus didn't heal him to prove his power or to prove anything to anybody, but he did it just because of his faith, and immediately he followed Jesus. Now, we don't know if he was blind from birth or if he uh, lost his sight later in life, but regardless, if you're blind and then you can see, this is a colorful world. There's a lot to do, and there's a lot he could have done. He could have done some really great things. He could have gone and told people. He could have gone and started working maybe for the first time in his life and provided for himself, which is all would have been really great things for him to do. But instead of doing something good, he did the best thing that he could have done, and that was to leave everything and follow Jesus. See, if we continue reading in the book of Mark, Jesus is about to enter Jerusalem. 
And what this means is, is this is kind of where um, all of his messianic purposes are, will be fulfilled. It's his triumphant entry where they sing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And this probably means that Bartimaeus was with him as he entered Jerusalem, that he was no longer seen as a social outcast, that he was no longer seen as less than, but he was a part of the group with everybody else as he entered Jerusalem. See, unlike the way society viewed him, Jesus welcomed him to join him. Others may have seen him as worthless, but Jesus saw value in him. So I'm curious if you've ever had a time where you felt worthless or valueless. If I'm being honest, this was a large part of my life growing up. I, as I mentioned earlier, I spent so much time and energy trying to find my identity and find who I was uh, in everything I could get my hands on other than Christ. And where it left me is a pretty prolonged period of pretty bitter depression, of anger, of hatred, of loneliness and, and solitude and, and ended up in a, in a period where I just, I really just wanted to end my own life. And if you've ever felt like that before, I want you to know that just like how we see that Bartimaeus was valuable to God, you are valuable to God. You are valuable to God. And when I say that, it's not some metaphorical you as in God so loved the world and I'm in the world, so I guess that's me. It's you by name are valuable to God. If you've ever struggled with feeling like you didn't matter, I want you to hear that you are valuable to God. You know, a, a, a few years back, I remember a, a pastor giving a challenge. And I don't remember the exact phrase that he used, but he, he challenged everyone to go home and look at themselves, look at themselves in the mirror, into their own eyes, and tell that person that you, by name, Brian, whatever your name is, are loved by God. And I remember hearing that and thinking, that's cute. Like, that's, yeah, okay, okay. And I didn't really think anything of it and then until later that week. I was like, yeah, you know what, whatever. I'll, 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 I was in the bathroom anyways. I'll just try it. And I, I'm looking at myself in the mirror, and I remember thinking, I can't. It took, me, it took me probably five or six times to get through it, to actually be able to look myself in the eye and tell myself that you are valuable, tell myself that you are loved. And so what I want you to hear is that when we say that God loves the world, that that means you, you by name specifically. You are known by name, and God loves you. And if you've ever struggled with feeling like you don't matter or with feeling like you aren't valuable, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over to the book of Ephesians and I'm going to read something to you. Um, if, if we uh, look at if the first chapter of Ephesians, there's this kind of big chunk of text that I'm going to read. It'll be up on the screens. You can read along with me or you can just kind of sit back and listen. But what this is, is it's, it's Ephesians 1 verses 3 through 14. So it's a little bit long. And in the original Greek, this is one long run-on sentence consisting of 202 words. And so this is not just like some thoughts stitched together at different times, put together in a way that sounds good. This is one continuous idea, continuous thought. And what Paul is doing is he's going on and on about the importance of Jesus and the importance that we have because of Jesus. So I'm just going to read this straight through, and then we'll unpack a little bit of what it says. Starting in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3, it says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realm with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Now, that was long. And it had a lot of bible words in it. And so... What I want to do is I want to break that down. In case you missed the laundry list of attributes that Paul 
um, attributes to you if you are a follower of Christ. This is what he says. He says, starting in verse 3, he says, You are blessed with every spiritual blessing. Verse 4, you were chosen before the creation of the world. Verse 5, you are adopted as sons. Verse 6, God's glorious grace has been given to you. Verse 7, you have been redeemed through his blood. Verse 7 again, you have been forgiven. Verse 8, grace has been lavished on you. Verse 8 again, you have been given wisdom and understanding. Verse 9, the mystery of his will was made known to you. Verse 11, you have received an inheritance. Verse 11 again, you have been predestined according to his plan. Verse 13, you are marked with a seal of the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, you are for his glory, and all that is in the first sentence of the book. This is who you are in Christ. And if Ephesians isn't convincing enough, we see this traced throughout the whole Bible. If we see all the way back in Genesis 1, we find out that you were created in the image of God. John 1 tells us that all who believe in his name have the right to become children of God. Romans 8 tells us that the spirit that you received brought about your adoption to sonship. 1 Corinthians 3 tells us that you are of Christ and Christ is of God. Galatians 4 tells us that you have received adoption to sonship. 1 John 3 says that you are called a child of God. If you ever feel like you don't matter, this is who you are if you are in Christ. You are, if you are a follower of Jesus, you have been adopted by God. And upon that adoption, you are part of his family and your identity is rooted in Christ. See that, that little four-year-old boy I talked about earlier, Theo, little squid boy? He was adopted. He was adopted. There he is. There's him the day he was born, and that's him last week. His birthday, his fourth birthday was last Sunday. And he got a squid. <laughs> um, but he has kind of a, a, a crazy adoption story. When uh, Back in 2019, we were down in Greenville, South Carolina, and we got a call as we were driving back. My wife got a call from somebody and she was on the phone, we were in the car, and she was talking to them for about 45 minutes. And her side of the conversation that I could hear consisted of mostly crying, and it was not on speakerphone. So I had no idea what was going on. I'm just, hope everything's okay. <laughs> and she gets off and she's like, this, that was this friend of ours from church, and she had a friend of hers contact her and to tell her that she's pregnant, going to be having a child soon, and wants to give it up for adoption and wants to know if she knows anybody. And so she wanted to see if she could recommend us. And so we told her, of, of course, we'd be willing to meet with her. Um, we did meet with her. Turns out we had, she had actually visited our church early in her pregnancy, and we hadn't met her before. But we sat down and talked with her, and we were like, look, we're not going to try and convince you to give, you your ki give us your kid. We, we're here to support you, and if the support you need is for someone to take your child in, we can give you that support. If the support you need is to Raise him yourself, we'll support you in that as well and do everything we can to help you. And we had a long conversation and she ended it with saying, we, would you be willing to adopt my child? And we said, of course. And then she said, great, he is due in three weeks. <laughs> and we said, what? And uh, we're like, okay, great. Um, we, were, we were foster parents at the time, so we had kids stuff, but we mostly had older kids. So we had to get a bunch of baby stuff. And um, turns out adoptions are like, crazy expensive. And when it's that short of a time frame, they are like 10 times more expensive. And so we had to just do everything we could. And people were super generous in helping make it happen. And everything fell into place in some crazy way. And thankfully, it all worked out. And we were able to be in the hospital with him when he was born. And so a couple hours after he was born, they wheeled him into our room. We met him for the first time. We named him. And the challenge was, though, that he was born towards the end of 2019. And then COVID happened and shut down everything and slowed all the courts down. And so his adoption wasn't finalized for 14 months. So for the first year and two months of his life, his legal name was Baby Boy. And there was nothing we could do about it. So we'd go to pediatrician appointments or we'd go to places and we'd say, they'd say, who are you here for? And we'd say, Baby Boy. <laughs> and they're like, okay. And, and he still had his uh, birth mother's last name, so it didn't even match our last name. Like, I promise he's ours. But um, we just, that's what we had to call him, because she didn't fill out the birth certificate. But for, from the moment that we met him, from the moment that he came into our lives, he was an Androsian. That's our last name. He was an Androsian. From the moment that we met him, regardless of what paperwork said, regardless of what anything else, he was a part of our family from day one. 
And no matter what other kids come into our home, no matter what, other, what happens with cousins or extended family, he is just as much a part of our family as anyone else that comes through our family. There is, just because of his past, he does not have an asterisk by his name, but he is a part of our family. And I want you to hear that just because of your past, you don't have an asterisk by your name. You are a part of God's family if you are in Christ. If you are in Christ, you are no longer baby boy. You are no longer baby girl. You have a name to God. You have been adopted into his family, and you are just as much a member of his family as anybody else. Just as much as the person who's got it all together, who's done everything perfect, you are just as much a part of his family as they are. And so I ask again the question I asked earlier, where do you find your identity? Where do you find your identity? If you've ever struggled to feel valuable, then hear this, you will always feel valueless. You will always feel insignificant when you're trying to find your value in anything of this world. See, we live in a world that's so focused on individualism and finding your own identity and being who you really are. But somehow, amidst that, we're lonelier than we've ever been. We're more depressed than we've ever been. We struggle with more things than we ever have before. And this will always be the case when we're trying to find our identity apart from Christ. See, not only does Jesus value the faithful, but he values the doubter. He values the one that society doesn't value. He values the one that is an outcast. He values you even in your struggles, even in your addiction, even in your challenges, even when you don't value yourself. He values you. See, you were made in God's image. You were bought at a price. You are valuable to God, and that value is given to us through Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He came to this earth and lived a human life and died a literal death. God sent his only son for, for the world, sure, but for you specifically. Knowing you by name, he sent his son. Jesus died for you so that you could have the possibility to spend eternity with him. And what does he ask from us? All he asks for us to do is to, to come to him and say, God, have mercy on me. I have faith, have mercy on me. And I promise if you do, if you cry that out to God, he will have mercy on you 100% of the time. Let's pray together. God, God, we are so undeserved of the love that you give to us. God, I am so undeserved of the love that you give to me. God, we, we mess it up time after time and day after day. And you don't look at us like a disappointed father. You don't look at us rolling your eyes and say, oh, there he goes again. But you say, no, come to me. Come to me. I have mercy. Just come to me. God, there's nothing we could ever do to earn that. There's nothing we could ever do to show you how thankful we are for that, God. We love you, and we thank you, God, so much for loving us. In Jesus' name.